is that we wrote it off when I was there in 1957. We wrote them all again. My books are coming in, but I think we'll get started. Okay. So that's fine. Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, my name is Christian Osterman. I direct the History and Public Policy Project here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and I'd like to welcome you to the Wilson Center. The Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars is, as many of you may know, the official U.S. memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. It is also, um, as an institute, uh, for advanced studies in the humanities and social sciences. The center tries to bridge the world of ideas and the world of policy, it tries to facilitate dialogue between the scholarly and the public policy community here in Washington. Directed by former Congressman Lee Hamilton, the center hosts about 150 scholars from around the world here annually and holds over 400 meetings on international and national affairs. Funded generously by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Henry Luce Foundation, and other donors, the Center's Cold War International History Project, part of the History and Public Policy Project, has for more than the past decade spearheaded a global effort to unlock and disseminate new documents and perspectives on the history of the Cold War, in particular from the previously inaccessible archives of what we used to call the other side, the former communist world. We publish a Cold War International History Project bulletin. Occasionally, the next issue actually is in the making at the printer, um, a Cold War International History Project bulletin of newly declassified and translated documents. And all of our documents uh, and translations are also available at no charge, can be downloaded at no charge from our website at CWIHP, Cold War International History Project, dot si dot edu. In addition to locating Translating and publishing documents, we organize international meetings on important aspects of the Cold War, and we host a small fellowship program for junior scholars. In April 2002, the project hosted an international conference on the Soviet war in Afghanistan. The documents obtained for this conference and relevant to today's um, seminar and book launch are being published in the new issue of the Cold War Project Bulletin good way to keep in touch with the project, by the way, is by signing up to our listserv. You'll receive invitations to events such as this, as well as announcements of new publications. We also try to provide a forum in the heart of Washington for the discussion of new, important, and relevant findings and publications, such as Ghost Wars, The Secret History of the CIA, Afghanistan, and Bin Laden, from the Soviet invasion to September 10, 2001, by Steve Cole, the subject of today's seminar and book launch. The book has been in bookstores since yesterday. Many of you may have had a chance to read um, some excerpts in the Washington Post. Let me add that this meeting is co-sponsored by the Center's Asia Program, the Center's Kennan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies, and the Center's Middle East Project. We appreciate the support of our fellow programs, projects here at the center. Let me also especially thank my assistant, Mircea Montiano, over there to the left, who has done much of the, uh, the heavy lifting in putting together this meeting while I spent the last 10 days in Tehran. Before I introduce our, distinguished, our three distinguished panelists, let me mention that this meeting is being broadcast live over the World Wide Web. Following the three presentations, we will have what I, I hope some time for questions and comments. would like uh, for those of you who have a question or like to comment to identify yourself during the discussion. <laughs> 
At about five o'clock, we'll move across the hall to a reception in the center's boardroom. There will be a chance to buy books, and I think uh, Mr. Cole will be, will be available to sign uh, some books. Now, let me welcome our speakers. I will introduce them um, as they speak. It's a great pleasure to welcome back to the center Steve Call, author of Ghost Wars and one of the nation's leading journalists. Steve Cole is the managing editor of the Washington Post, where he has been a foreign correspondent and editor since 1985. He has held various positions there, including feature writer for the Style Section, financial correspondent in New York, South Asia correspondent based in India, the Post's first international project and investigative correspondent based in London, editor of the Washington Post magazine and publisher of the magazine. While working in these distinguished positions, Mr. Cole has covered subjects ranging from the Securities and Exchange Commission, about which he co-wrote a series of articles that won the 1990 Pulitzer Prize for explanatory journalism, to India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and occasionally the Middle East. His South Asia dispatches won the 1992 Livingston Award for Outstanding International Journalism. Mr. Cole is the author of four books uh, published prior to Ghost Wars, The Deal of the Century, 1986, The Taking of Getty Oil, 1987, Eagle on the Street with David Wise, 1990, and On the Grand Turk Road, 1994. Delighted to say that Steve participated in our April 2002 conference on the Soviet war in Afghanistan, which I just mentioned, and we're absolutely delighted to welcome him back to the center, this time for launching his very own new book, Ghost Wars. Steve, let me congratulate you on this extraordinary achievement and turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you for organizing this event, which promises to be a lot of fun. And thank you also for the extraordinary work that you and your colleagues do, and for the, in particular, the work you did on Afghanistan, which I think was important not just to me, but to a lot of other people. You brought a lot to the record that would not otherwise have been available in English in such a timely way. I really admire what you do over here. I'm going to just take about 20 to 25 minutes, uh, try to keep an eye on my watch, because I'd love to have a lot of time for questions and discussion after George and Milton speak, and I'm very grateful for their appearance here today. I obviously have a lot of respect for both of them, and I'm sure out in the audience there's much more expertise than there is, uh, at least at the podium at the moment, and I'd love to hear from some of you and try to make this uh, then as uh, inclusive as we can. What I thought I'd do in the time that I have is give you a better sense than you might have uh, to date of what the book is and what's in it. Uh, I'm, going, I'm not going to repeat any of the stuff that's been in the post, figuring that uh, those of you who are interested would have read it. And since the book was uh, under embargo, uh, it probably hasn't been time to re read it uh, over the last 24 hours. So I thought I'd just give you a sense of, of what it is and what it covers and some of the highlights in the hope that, in part, that will stimulate comments uh, from George or uh, Milton and questions from the audience. What I tried to do in this book was to write a narrative of the history of the antecedents of September 11th as they were located in Afghanistan, beginning in 1979 and ending on September 10th. I tried to place a special emphasis in my narrative on the role of the CIA, Pakistani intelligence, and Saudi intelligence, for reasons that are obvious. They were the principal actors over those uh, 20 years. Uh, certainly, the agency was the principal um, focus of American policy for patches at that time. Uh, the book's based mainly on about 200 interviews with American, Afghan, Pakistani, and Saudi participants in the events it attempts to describe. Uh, 
I also I traveled to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia in the course of the research. I also tried to draw on as many documentary sources as I could locate, uh, private memoirs, private records. But I was aware throughout of uh, you know basic limitation that I was talking about with Milton, which is that there you know for a lot of this history there are no documents. There are never going to be documents um, realistically, and uh, you know, I mean certainly there are. Uh, investigators in Washington with subpoena power who may obtain some of these documents and selectively publish them. Um, but from my point of view, it was uh, difficult and always a limitation of the project that it was essentially what I do. It was a piece of journalism. I mean, it was not uh, rooted in uh, anything more or less than the, my ability to construct the narrative out of careful interviewing and uh, trying to connect those interviews with documentary records and secondary sources where they were available. You know, I, my goal was uh, to try to bring multiple and uh, balanced points of view to bear on various controversial episodes and to try to lay the history out in full. Um, it's a first draft of a history that I think Americans will go back to. Uh, I wanted to try to put it down once in a neutral and, and nonpartisan way, but also in a lively and accessible way. I've had an awful lot of help along the way from very good people who I uh, can't tell you more about. To try to get this down approximately right, it was slow going in a lot of ways. And uh, I was aware all along that because of my heavy reliance on interviews uh, without access to anything like a full archive of uh, classified materials, I know that I've made at least some, probably more than some, mistakes of fact and interpretation. It's inevitable. You know, I'm just not sure what the mistakes are yet. Uh, we'll figure that out, I'm sure, over the next uh, few months. So what's the story that I'm trying to tell here? Um, the book's three parts, roughly in equal proportion, outline what I think is properly read as a three-chapter history of American engagements in Afghanistan as they connect to the events of September 11th. The first section is about the period of the anti-Soviet jihad from 1979 until 1989, during which the United States collaborated with uh, Pakistani and Saudi intelligence to aid the Afghan uh, mujahideen battling Soviet occupying forces. The second phase of this history, at least as I see it, uh, covers the years roughly from 1989. The Soviets uh, pulled out across the bridge in February of 1989, and it runs until roughly late 1997, early 1998. In very broad terms, this is a story of American retreat from Afghanistan, the rise of the Taliban, the full radicalization of bin Laden himself, the maturation of al-Qaeda into a terrorist organization with a global agenda, gradual breakdown, or certainly the erosion of common cause among uh, the CIA, ISI, and Saudi intelligence. Um, and the third and final part, which is the part that sort of appeared in, in uh, highlighted form in the paper, sort of covers the period from the spring of 1998 until September 10th. And it focuses on uh, the return of uh, CIA covert action and uh, very active intelligence collection in Afghanistan, this time with a mandate to uh, capture, disrupt, or kill bin Laden and some of his lieutenants. So I thought what I'd do with my time is give you a, at least a few highlights and subjects and themes from each of these three parts that you don't know about already in the hope that, again, they maybe stimulate your questions. Um, in the 1980s, this is uh, something I'd, I wonder I'd be interested in, in uh, both of uh, the commentator, commentators on. I became fascinated by the relationship between uh, Saudi intelligence and bin Laden himself. Um, as the book describes, uh, I think pretty transparently, I, in the course of my reporting, went to Saudi Arabia and I met uh, uh, two of Prince Turki al Faisal's chief aides during this period. The chief of staff of Saudi intelligence, a fellow named Ahmed Badib, and his brother Saeed Badib, who ran the equivalent of their uh, director of intelligence, and uh, talked to them about their relationship with bin Laden during the 80s. And uh, 
from these interviews, which were uh, on the record, and they also included the only other interview that I think Ahmed Badiv has ever given, to my knowledge, anyway, is an interview in Arabic that he gave to a Lebanese television station. He gave me a cassette tape of it. I had it translated. Um, he describes a much fuller uh, sense of his relationship, of their relationship with bin Laden in the mid-'80s than at least I had ever sort of had before. Um, you know, Badib came from the same uh, part of the world as the bin Ladens. Uh, he was actually a teacher of Osama bin Laden at some stage of bin Laden's education. I don't think it was at university, but uh, they were, uh, he was a, a, a pupil. Uh, and then Badib worked with Prince Turki al Faisal on the frontier, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, running sort of Saudi unilateral operations, if you want to call them that. They were a lot of charity work and uh, support for various factions, um, Sayaf and others. And uh, Badib describes a relationship with bin Laden that was pretty close to operational in the sense that bin Laden seemed to build specific things that the Saudis wanted built for reasons that were known to them, I guess, in the early to mid-'80s. And as I understand the sort of broad relationship between the United States and Saudi intelligence during this period, it was not an operational relationship. There was no liaison on the ground in Pakistan. It was a check-writing relationship. The deal was that uh, whatever covert funds the United States Congress allocated in a given year, we went out to uh, Saudi Arabia and told uh, King or whoever was uh, available, and uh, they wrote a check to match the, the amount. And, uh, and then we managed that separately from them in partnership with ISI. But the Saudis nonetheless, of course, had their own uh, agenda on the ground separate from that check-writing agenda. And this is the world that uh, Badib and uh, bin Laden moved in in the mid-1980s. Mid and uh, there's much more mystery than certainty about it, but there's a, there's a kind of a sense of it coming into focus uh, through, through some of this material that, that uh, intrigued me. Um, it explains how bin Laden built up his own relationships inside IFI, ISI's Afghan Bureau because he was out there where they were um, building these uh, medical facilities and depots and other things that he later brought the cameras to see in, uh, in uh, the late 1980s. And it explains sort of a continuity of his relationships that leads to his role training uh, guerrillas for Kashmir uh, and other uh, theaters uh, in collaboration with the Pakistanis uh, a little bit later, early 90s or so. You know, the other big issue here, and there's a quite a lot about it in the book, and uh, uh, Milton lived through it. He has his own articulate points of view about it, which are well expressed in his memoir, which I've also relied on um, as an important uh, source. Um, you know, which is the whole subject of CIA-Pakistani collaboration, particularly during the late 80s uh, when it gets really complicated. Um, and uh, I'd be interested in his uh, views about what he now sort of emphasizes looking back on that. Obviously, our agendas uh, were, you know, sort of diverging as the years went by, and they particularly diverged after 1989, but they were beginning to sort of start to unravel uh, toward the end of, uh, of his tour, and that's a, a place where a lot of the sort of independent Pakistani Islamist agenda starts to uh, express itself in uh, ways that uh, later become quite menacing, I think. So the second, then, so that's the first phase. The second phase of the book um, describes this very complicated but I think really important period between the time of the Soviet withdrawal and uh, the emergence of bin Laden as a quite an active and uh, open uh, aspirant to uh, Sunni Islamic militant leadership, or however you choose to describe it. And it's a, it's in a chronicle of sort of American uh, eyesight, American withdrawal, American policy um, during this time. And, and it's also about the rise of the Taliban Ahmed Rashid has told the story quite well from a Pakistani point of view and also done some very useful journalism about American policy. But I've tried to go from the American side, uh, you know, a couple of other layer, layers down. And uh, 
is a really interesting period between 1994 and 1996 before the Taliban take Kabul as they are defining themselves, as they are rising, and as the Pakistani establishment is trying to decide what to do about them. And uh, you'll see in the book uh, an on-the-record lengthy interview uh, quoted a number of times with uh, Benazir Bhutto describing her recollections of her then private debates with uh, ISI and the army about whether or not to uh, work with the Taliban and whether or not to build them up. And uh, it's really quite fascinating because, of course, Hekmadiyar was still their client. He was a discredited, fading client in these years, but he was their guy. And uh, there were lots of people, I think, or there were certainly some officers in the Afghan Bureau who, who felt that uh, it was in Pakistan's interest to, to stay with Hekmadiyar. But uh, Buddha describes how, over the course of 18 months, the Taliban's supporters um, sort of won the argument in, in her council and persuaded her of, to write what she describes as essentially a blank check to them to support the ISI. Everything that everybody ever suspected uh, at the time, she basically says, yeah, it was all, it was all going on, more or less uh, in the order that people suspected. And she... <laughs> The other thing that's really remarkable to look back on it just as a kind of cautionary aspect of uh, current affairs is uh, to just see in, in just kind of very detailed, in a very detailed chronological way how repeatedly and how uh, brazenly she and the civilians in the Pakistani government lied over and over again to the American interlocutors. I mean, just not even blinked, you know, and of course Zia was famous for being able to do this about the nuclear program and there's lots of good sort of documentary record about how he thought about this, it was his responsibility to lie to the Americans. And, uh, but it didn't matter whether it was, uh, you know, senators coming out to lunch in Islamabad or uh, assistant secretaries of state in Washington or it didn't matter the forum, even speeches to Congress, you go back and you look at the sentences that she uttered in the documents and the cables and the speeches, and then you compare them to what she now says was going on and to what she knew. It's really um, remarkable. Not sort of shocking. It's sort of, I mean, you don't want to kind of, as that kind of Casablanca shock, shock to discover that Benazir was lying about this stuff, but um, it's, it's very sort of vivid. Um, so as to the Americans, uh, you know, we were out of it by the mid-90s. We, we saw no interests in Afghanistan. We had adopted uh, Benazir's agenda. We were sort of uh, accepting of her arguments and presumptions, I think, about the region. I'm sure some of you lived through that in much more detail than uh, I can bring to bear. But, uh, you know, some of the, you know, the CIA had no station in Afghanistan. Of course, the embassy had closed for security reasons uh, back in 88, 89. And uh, uh, even the Islamabad station wasn't really budgeted or uh, oriented toward uh, Afghanistan in those years. I'm talking about mid-90s now. Um, and we, were, we weren't really collecting very much information about the Taliban. We didn't really know who they are. We were, you know, we had some diplomats and other people doing good political reporting, but uh, we didn't have a sense of them. And we were focused with the limited resources we had on Pakistani subjects. Those were important, obviously complicated subjects themselves, their nuclear program, their support for regional uh, Islamic groups, domestic stability, whether or not there would be a, uh, a coup, an Islamist-led coup within the army, was there grounds for such a thing? One of my favorite stories was I talked to an American who was involved in all of this, and he, he told me that one of his um, annual exercises was to conduct a beard census at the Quetta Staff College, which is the elite military college in Pakistan, very British-influenced, Sandhurst-influenced, and, and he would go down and uh, every year count how many of the graduating, I don't know whether they're lieutenants, but something equivalent, uh, had beards. And, uh, and he would chart this over time. And he was reassured that the trend was not sort of like through the roof or anything. And, uh, and then he said that uh, after September 11th, he went to do this exercise and there was an ISI guy with the same chart. He was also taking a census. Uh, so suddenly, the Pakistani army itself had become worried about this. 
and they got into an argument about whether or not short beards should be counted. <laughs> were these just fashion beards or were these uh, an expression of personal piety? Anyway, if that's uh, the margin of error that we're operating on, I'm more nervous than I normally am. Um, so, you know, why did, the, why did we pull out uh, so thoroughly from Afghanistan? I mean, you know, this, I try to narrate this in a lot of fullness. It's obviously very complicated. Um, you know, there was a broad exhaustion in the United States, even among South Asia hands with the Afghan story. Uh, there was a sense of uh, uh, repetition and intractability. The Democrats uh, in power at the White House were turning away from theaters that had been the focus of Republican attention. Afghanistan was seen as sort of an old story, an old Cold War story. There was a lot of emphasis about uh, other places in the developing world that required American attention, including Africa and other uh, big subjects. So, you know, I think the South Asia Bureau uh, didn't have a lot of alternative views other than the one that Budo's civilian elite still sort of notionally attractive uh, presented. And then, of course, we got caught up in this whole uh, unical story, which I'll uh, uh, leave for the book. But it, uh, you know, I think looking back on it, it's all, it's all kind of pretty tawdry. Um, you know, in this context, bin Laden returns to Afghanistan in May of uh, 1996. And in uh, September, uh, the station chief goes to visit Massoud in Kabul, talk about stinger recovery, talk about the fact that bin Laden's there. Um, and that's, you know, it's a very sort of uh, sporadic beginning, but that sort of marks the beginning of the return and the phase that is uh, uh, described in the third part of the book. Um, you know, a lot of the highlights uh, from that narrative I tried to condense into those excerpts, but and the theme of Masood I'll come back to. Um, there's a couple of stories that aren't there that, I, that I'll just sort of mention, sort of variations on a theme, I suppose. Um, and you may have questions when I, there's a lot of interesting elements here about it. what were the legal authorities, what was the culture of the uh, operators, what were the arguments with the White House and that sort of thing. I try to sort of set an outline of that into into the paper. One of the episodes that uh, I think still resonates with some of the people who participated in it anyway occurred in uh, uh, early 1999. Essentially, the Clinton administration, after the Africa embassy bombing, set in motion what I think you know could fairly be described as a two-track policy. On the one hand, they uh, commissioned the agency to try to pinpoint bin Laden's location precisely enough so that they could consider launching a second cruise missile strike against him. Of course, they had uh, attempted to strike in August itself and had missed him. And so one of the mandates of uh, the operators was to try to figure out where bin Laden was with enough confidence so that they could send these missiles in. And the sort of confirmation to strike time was a few hours by the end, you know, people describe it four hours, six hours, but you know, would take some time to get everything loaded up and shoot. So that was a pretty demanding uh, request to be able to forecast where someone would be for the next six hours with enough degree of confidence so that you would feel comfortable landing a bunch of uh, uh, tomahawks on top of it. and. Uh, then the second element was operations or liaisons or, or plans that would uh, potentially lead to bin Laden's capture, uh, his perhaps his arrest for trial in federal court in New York, or perhaps his death in the course of an arrest attempt. There was a lot of evolution and debate about this track, but it was going on almost in parallel with the other track. And, all these things are so compartmented, it's not always clear who knew what about everybody else's uh, stuff. But it's, that's basically the portrait when this episode occurs. And uh, so this is now someplace between Christmas of 98 and March 1 and 99. About as, I mean, that's, I, 
I feel dead certain that it's in that zone. I think it's basically the first six or eight weeks of 99. Somebody out there may have the documents. I'd love to see them. Um, and this uh, group of paid agents who are tasked to follow bin Laden around as best they can, among other things, uh, pick up that he's going into the desert in southern Afghanistan to hunt for Buster by Falcon. Bin Laden grew up in this kind of Buster hunting tradition, I guess, and uh, he had made contact with the, some of the Pakistani and Afghan radical parties around Kandahar even earlier through these Buster hunting expeditions, which really quite formidably built up and very elaborate, uh, involving uh, you know C one thirties going in with big tents full of refrigerators and generators, and you know people really. This is uh, not just wandering. And uh, so he goes out apparently on one of these uh, hunting expeditions and he's tracked into the desert and the agents report back and say, you know, we've got a fix on him. It's definitely him. They've set up in the stationary camp. There's some sort of an airstrip there. Uh, station puts up overhead. They look down and they see by, uh, I feel, you know, I, I think there's a pretty authoritative account that they, they pick up a tail number on the on the transport plane and they figure out that it's a uh, belongs to the United Arab Emirates. And uh, the agents are sitting up on this ridge and uh, they keep saying, he's there, he's there, and there's all this back and forth about how sure are you. And in the end, uh, at the White House and the National Security Cabinet, the President and the DCI trying to figure out what to do, they feel stuck with what um, Tenet frequently refers to as single-threaded intelligence, meaning that it's familiar to me, you know, basically one source. Do you have two independent sources? You only have one source. You know, do you, does the satellite count as a second source? Not really. I mean, you know, it's, so it's single-threaded in the sense that you've got one group of paid agents who are 120% sure that they got them, and you don't have a second source. So is that good enough to put that kind of munitions down on that kind of a target when you may have reason to believe that some member of one of the royal families of the United Arab Emirates may be there or even somebody senior in that family. So they decide not to pull the trigger and of course the people who have been involved in the operation this is very frustrating to them. Hard to understand. We got them. We got them. Let's go. And that's a pattern that kind of repeats itself over and over again on the ground. You know people really sort of pouring themselves into it back at headquarters, people saying, do we really have enough? And that's kind of what that narrative feels like. Masood plays a big part in it. You know, another thing that is a, re a recurring theme in this period is the relationship with ISI, uh, the liaison. You know, they tried to use ISI to set up bin Laden. It didn't work. They asked the ISI to set bin Laden up at Kandahar Airport, call a meeting, we'll hit him on the way to the airport. ISI says, we can't do that. Just doesn't work for us. You know the story of this commando unit drawn from retired Pakistani special forces. It ends up being a kind of uh, Praetorian guard for uh, Nawaz Sharif and s seems in the end as much conceived for use in domestic crisis uh, management as against bin Laden anyway. It never goes into action. Um, that whole sort of narrative of our interactions with ISI between 1998 and 2001, I think, is really important, and it's a version of it is still underway today. Obviously, circumstances are much changed. Hard for me to judge how much different it is now. You know, another thing that I uh, try to write about in in some broad form is Clinton's relationship with the CIA. Um, I'd be interested in people's comments about that. Um, you know, except for the individuals of Deutsch and Tenet, um, seems on the whole you know, quite distant and even uh, mutually suspicious. That's at least uh, what I concluded after my reporting. You did have Sudan and the Chinese embassy and other targeting controversies that uh, shook the president's face. And I also have a sense that John Deutsch essentially came back uh, and said to the president, these guys are no good, and that he trusted Deutsch. And, uh, and that that shaped some of his uh, 
thinking. I think he probably was, he never from the beginning, from his first term, he never really had a comfortable relationship with the place. Um, and then finally there's Masood and that whole sort of narrative, and I know uh, Milt will uh, give me some uh, guff for, you know, sort of regarding Masood as, uh, as uh, a solution. And, uh, but I, I do think that I, for my part, preemptive defense here, uh, I do think that I have a realistic view of Masood and his flaws, um, and I don't think that there's any sort of silver bullet retrospective theory available in all of this. But, there's a, but it's a thread that you can pull right through this history, and it takes you right to the cusp of September 11th, and in it lies a lot of the uh, broader uh, theme themes that uh, I think are important to understanding where this all came from and how it evolved. Um, I'll just finish. I don't do a lot of interpretation in the book. I don't think uh, a great majority of it is uh, written as a narrative history, a lot of emphasis on character events and context. And um, But I'll just read, if you don't mind, just a couple of paragraphs from the uh, from the end and then I'll uh, turn it over. Afghanistan after 1979 was a laboratory for political and military visions conceived abroad and imposed by force. The language and ideas that described Afghan parties, armies, and militias originated with theoreticians in universities and seminaries in Europe, Cairo, and Diabond. Afghans fought as, quote, communists or as, quote, freedom fighters. They joined jihadist armies battling on behalf of an imagined global Islamic ummah. A young, weak nation, Afghanistan produced few convincing nationalists who could offer an alternative, who could define Afghanistan from within. And Massoud was an exception to that rule. Yet Massoud did not create the Afghanistan he championed. Partly he failed as a politician during the early 1990s. Partly he was limited by his regional roots, especially as the Afghan wars fragmenting violence promoted ethnic solidarity. Most of all, Massoud was contained by the much greater resources possessed by his adver adversaries in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. At the end of his life, and I think it's in the late 90s that he's the most interesting sort of figure in this story, as he fought the Taliban and al-Qaeda, he sought the, saw the potential to recover his nationalist vision of <coughs> Afghanistan through an alliance with the United States. He saw this partnership primarily as a tactician would, grounded not in ideology but in urgent and mutual interest, the need to contain and defeat Osama bin Laden and his jihadist volunteers. Massoud did also fight for political ideas. He was not a Democrat in an American or European sense, although conceivably he could, become, he could have become one in a peaceful post-war era. He was indisputably tolerant in the midst of terrible violence and he was prepared to work in coalitions. Massoud frustrated bin Laden and the Taliban because of his exceptional tactical skills primarily, but also because he competed credibly for control of Afghanistan's political identity. The Afghan government that the United States eventually chose to support, beginning in the late autumn of 2001, Federation of Massoud's organization, exiled intellectuals and royalist Pashtuns, was available for sponsorship before, but the United States could not see a reason then to challenge the alternative. Instead, as the 1990s unfolded, first out of indifference, then with misgivings, and finally in a state of frustrated inertia, the United States endorsed year after year the Afghan programs of its two sullen, complex, and sometimes vital allies, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. Massoud's independent character and conduct and the hostility toward him continually fed into the American bureaucracy by Pakistan, denied him a lasting alliance with the United States, and ultimately it denied the United States whatever benefits he might have offered during the several years before 2001. At the end of this uh, road lay September 2001, when the American public and the subsistence traders of the Pangaea Valley discovered in twin cataclysms that they were bound together after all, if not by the political ideas they shared, then at least by the enemies who had chosen them. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Steve. As, uh
Many of you know, as a scholarly institution, we uh, uh, like to not just host your run-of-the-mill book launch, but try to bring additional, broader perspectives into the discussion. So we have the great fortune today to have as commentators two veterans of the Ghost Wars, uh, Milt Bearden and George Cave, who are not only renowned experts on the Middle East and South Asia, but whose lives as mentioned, intersected with some of the events covered by Steve's book. They will start off our discussion today. Let me add that since the book has only been available for a couple of days, I've asked Milt and George to share some of their insights on the general subject based on their experience rather than to provide sort of a full-fledged, detailed review of the book. Now let me introduce our first commentator, Milt Burden. Milt Bearden retired from the Central Intelligence Agency in 1994 after 30 years in the CIA's clandestine services. He rose through the ranks to become one of the CIA's most senior officers and one of the most highly decorated operations officers in its senior service. Mr. Bearden is the author of the main, co-author of The Main Enemy, the inside story of the CIA's final showdown with the KGB, published last year, and The Black Tulip, a novel of war in Afghanistan. He's also a frequent contributor to the op-ed pages of the New York Times, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, and so forth. For service in the CIA, Mr. Bearden was awarded the agency's highest decoration, the Distinguished Intelligence Medal, as well as other commendation and awards. Milt, I'm delighted you can be here with us today. The floor is yours. You're welcome to stay at the, um, the desk, if you like. Uh, so thank you, Christian. <clears throat> and uh, thanks again for the work that you do here. Uh, some of the documentation that has come uh, become available through Christian's operation and through Tom Blanton's operation, National Security op uh, Archives, on Afghanistan is among the best uh, that is anywhere in the world. Uh, most of it happens to be Russian, translated into English rather than you, uh, American documentation. Uh, so I sympathize, having written a book on part of this, uh, this that is covered by Steve Cole's book, uh, with those looking for the elusive American document. I also would, would point out that the publishing world is among the strangest of all. I see my lovely uh, uh, publicist from Random House uh, kind of tucked back there in the back, but they've done something here that's even different. I haven't had time to even do what you do in Washington with a new book, is to rush to the back and find your name and then read that part. So uh, I can't comment on, on anything other than uh, what Steve has told us uh, in his remarks. But I, 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 I know Steve well enough to, to, to sense that this is probably very important work that goes through that, that whole episode. Uh, I find that, that, uh, there are many dynamics that have just happened too fast for us all, uh, that, that we'll need to to uh, understand uh, as people labor uh, on to uh, put them down on paper. Uh, one, one can only sympathize with, uh, with uh, Steve as he tried to, to, to sort out the U.S.-Pakistani relationship, and that's, that's as vital today as it was at all the points along the, uh, uh, the timeline that are covered in this book and that are covered in, in, in uh, the whole story of South Asia. Um, that that relationship alone has been rocky. Uh, I've always likened it to that 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 perennial Charlie Brown strip where Lucy's holding the football, and Charlie's going to do. He says, "One more time, I'll try this, and you're going to hold it right." And she says yes, and then he runs up to kick it. She moves the football back, and Charlie's leg comes out of joint again every year since we were all youngsters. When I say that about U.S. PAC relations, uh, somebody usually jumps up kind of angrily and says, well, who's Lucy and who's Charlie Brown? Uh, 
I think uh, the, at least the Pakis, uh, the Pakistanis believe that uh, we're Lucy, and uh, and that is part of the whole thing, which which brings in these wonderful uh, recollections. I'm sure that are in here about uh, Muhammad Zia ul Haq lying to us. Goodness gracious, yes. Uh, we sailed in at the end of a, one of our endless series of sanctions in 1979 after the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan and after uh, Zbig Brzezinski and Jimmy Carter looked at the map and says, well, I guess we'll have to go to Afghanistan if we're going to do anything about this because China would be too hard, the Soviet Union, well, that won't work, and Iran, well, no, we've got our hostage situation and all of that. So we went into Pakistan, and we dealt with them. They thought, Zia probably, uh, he thought that by the time I got into the show in Afghanistan in 1985 that probably we'd be around for the long haul. He's, he, he said that uh, he, he figured Ronald Reagan and Bill Casey would serve him well enough. Uh, he lied to us uh, every day about the bomb, I think because he thought we wanted to hear the lie, uh, that, there, that there was some sort of an agreement uh, that uh, as long as he didn't turn the last screw and paint B-O-M-B -B on it, we would we would be able to say that they weren't a nuclear state. I think the biggest frailty of all the, the Pakistan-U.S. relationships was that uh, Pakistanis and Americans go in, sit down, have a long talk, walk away, and neither one of them have the same opinion of what just took place. And that goes on today to this date. Uh, talking to Benazir was always a, a remarkable thing. She did it better than anybody else. Uh, she was uh, that good because we loved to love her. Our Congress loved to love her. She was a pretty lady. She'd gone to Harvard. She was uh, from Oxford. She just, uh, there was almost nothing that was wrong except we never understood who Benazir was e either. And I think maybe that, that Steve will bring some new light to that. Now, uh, what what I might comment on is in that first part of the book, uh, the U.S.-Pakistani uh, relationship did indeed uh, uh, start begun undergoing a significant change in 1998, or 1988, excuse me. That change was prompted by signing the Geneva Accords. And then the distrust came in. The U.S. and the Soviets had signed an agreement in Geneva which rushes this Afghan thing to a conclusion, the Soviets would leave uh, uh, with a front-loaded withdrawal and be out uh, in 18 months, and in fact, uh, no, out in a year, uh, and in fact, uh, they stuck to it. Uh, the next thing that happened was uh, our ammunition dump outside of uh, Rawalpindi blew up, and they didn't know whether the Indians did it. They always loved to have that happen. Uh, or I did it. Or the, the KGB and I did it. Because we were, we'd signed in Geneva and we were now working together and we were getting ready to screw them. Uh, by August of that same year, the next thing that happened was uh, a C-130 with the president of Pakistan. Uh, the American ambassador, a wonderful uh, American brigadier general by the name of Herb Wassum, and uh, a whole bunch of uh, Zia's generals, brigadiers, and uh, colonels went down in under strange circumstances uh, to the point that they believed, first, you have to look around and see uh, you know, who was not on the plane. Guess who? Uh, so uh, after they went through the Indian thing, and, and the ISI director general at that time was Hamid Go, and we had this bizarre conversation. He said, the Indians did it. And I said, you know, we've been looking at this as hard as we can, at the, uh, and, and, and we don't see any evidence of that at all. And he said, Mr. Milton, you don't get it. The Indians are very clever. They don't leave evidence. So that's the proof that it was them. <laughs> and I said, you're going to have to work on that with me. But um, he did get over that. He, he finally decided the Indians didn't do it. He decided I'd done it because we had uh, 
we'd had enough of Zia and we had to get him out of the way. So that's the kind of mindset we dealt with. But the Pakistanis in many ways were right. Um, they, they probably figured that we would uh, not linger too long before we slipped out on the fire escape and slipped on our trousers and kind of shinnied down the ladder to get out of there after the Soviets pulled out on the 15th of February 1989. Now, I'll, before I um, hand this down the way here, let me comment on Masood. Uh, I probably don't disagree with what will come out uh, on Masood here. I will give you a, a description of Ahmed Shah. Masood was possibly the only senior Afghan commander who had a chance at being a, a natural statesman whose, whose interests in Afghanistan could go beyond his own clan, tribe, or region. Now, I didn't say that. Uh, that was given to me when I was researching my book in Moscow and uh, General Leonid uh, Shabarshin, who was the KGB general in charge of getting Mikhail Gorbachev out of Afghanistan, told me, he said, the only guy that had a way of, of becoming a statesman was Masood. I also learned during the research with uh, both uh, National Security Archives and Christian's uh, operation that while we were very very kind to Masood personally, the CIA, we took care of him. Uh, and I think that has come out in some of the, uh, the, the news accounts of this. Um, I signed off on $200,000 a month to uh, Ahmed Shah uh, just to get beyond the, the, the nastiness that he had with the Pakistanis. Uh, his own party leader, uh, uh, Rabani, was very well taken care of, but he himself didn't didn't share much with uh, Masood, and the reality was that Masood saw earlier than anybody in the uh, in the the great game revisited that the Soviets were actually going to leave. By 1987, I'm absolutely convinced that he said they're going out. I'm not going to spend any more time on this war, which he didn't. Uh, I would say that uh, by by the middle part of '87, he stopped fighting the Soviets. You you will all remember, or we'll cover in here, that that he he'd made a truce with them before in, in in the early '80s. But he was already building a thing called the Supreme Council of the North, and uh, that later became the Northern Alliance. He was already planning for the hereafter. Well, that didn't do me much good as somebody trying to get uh, Ahmed Shah to do something up around the Salang Tunnel or to do something uh, up around Mazari Sharif operationally. So I just gave up on him and figured that he was up to something else. That doesn't mean that he isn't exactly what perhaps Steve thinks he was, one of the most important characters. He just wasn't worth a nickel to me. Uh, and my job was just one simple, straightforward job, do whatever it takes to get the Soviets across the Oxus River. End of story. Uh, I wasn't there to try to get the Methodists or the, the Lutherans or, or uh, anybody to take over in Kabul. It was just to get in and, and get the Soviets out, and that was it. And I think that was probably uh, the most unencumbered uh, mission that I could have had. But uh, Masood will never be more diminished. Uh, I think he will, he will uh, have uh, survived anything I've ever said or written, and I think that... Uh, uh, Steve's cut of that part of the history here will probably be very, very useful. Um, I'm delighted, uh, in closing, I'm delighted to see that, that, that Steve has got this out there. It's a hugely complex period. It is complicated immensely uh, by, by American politics, uh, uh, as alluded to by Steve, but not overly so. Uh, I think the Clinton administration didn't want anything to do with this uh, enterprise uh, because if you started talking about the, the Afghan uh, enterprise, then pretty soon you might have to recognize that, that Ronald Reagan had actually done something that resulted uh, in, in uh, uh, what happened nine months after the Soviets pulled out of uh, Afghanistan was a breach of the Berlin Wall. 329 days after that, you had the uh, uh, Germany's reunited inside NATO. 
and on Boxing Day of 1991, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. I think we wanted just to get all that behind us. So uh, I'm delighted to, to be here, delighted to uh, have uh, had a chance to comment on this subject. I'm going to read the book to, beginning tomorrow, but I'm going to go to the back and get my name and go back and read those parts first. I usually want to see if I'm paunchy or big-boned or what, how they do that. Yeah. Big-boned, I think. Thank you very much. Milt, um, our second commentator is also a distinguished intelligence veteran, George W. Cave. George enlisted in the Army in 1947 after studying cryptoanalysis and later Farsi at the Army Language School in 1949. He was assigned to the Armed Forces Security Agency, which in 1952 became known as the National Security Agency. In May 1952, George Cave left the Army, entering Princeton University, graduating cum laude from there in 1956, the year he began with the Central Intelligence Agency and spent extensive time as a CIA officer in the Middle East. He returned to CIA headquarters in June of 1976 and served as Deputy Chief of the Near East Division, later as Deputy Chief of the Policy Coordination Staff. After the occupation of the American Embassy in Tehran, George Cave was assigned to Europe as Chief of an advance group supporting the hostage rescue mission. He retired conditionally in February 1980, though he had to remain on contract until the hostage crisis was resolved. He continues to be a consultant with the agencies on issues of the Middle East. It is my great pleasure to welcome you, George, back to the Wilson Center. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, every time Christian calls me, I know that uh, what I'm going to get assigned to do will deal with ancient history. So I'll give you some ancient history about our involvement in Afghanistan. In Mr. Cole's book, he mentions that in 1991, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we wrote off Afghanistan uh, as of being no strategic interest to in the United States. This is very interesting because this was a question that was raised in 1956. In November of 1956, Bulganin and Khrushchev visited Kabul. During the course of that visit, they provided the Afghans with a $100 million loan. In 1956, 100 million bucks was pretty big bucks. And uh, there was a great deal of concern in Washington. Herbert Hoover, Jr. was Under Secretary of State, and he called Alan Dulles and, and said that he wanted him to beef up the Kabul station and find out just what the Soviets were up to. I had joined the agency in, just in October and was down at the farm in training, and uh, I was called in on Friday and told to pack up everything that I wasn't coming back and given a name to report to on Monday. I got a briefing that I was going to go to uh, Kabul for a short TDY because I was the only one that they could come up that had, with that had fluent Farsi, and in those days Farsi was the official language in Afghanistan. I left in January, and I had a wonderful time. And in fact, going to Kabul is what convinced me that I made the right career choice. Uh, the station was pretty impressive. We reported in great detail, exhausting detail in some cases, on every agreement signed between the Soviets and the Afghans. We provided the minutes of every significant meeting between Afga senior Afghan officials and Soviet officials. Uh, and we also had some good penetrations of the military, and we found out that, first of, of great interest is when I arrived, uh, the Afghan Air, Air Force was flying Gypsy Moth aircraft. That's the only aircraft they had in their inventory. And every morning you see one of these bi-wing Gypsy Moths take off and fly, fly around Kabul on patrol for about a half an hour and then land. We learned that they had, the Soviets were training Afghan pilots 
on jets and that they had made an agreement uh, to supply the Afghans with MiG-17s. The ambassador at the time was a man named Shelley Mills who had been a prep school president, I think. And uh, he braced the foreign minister, who was Daoud's brother, and asked him about it, and the foreign minister denied that they were getting MiG-17s. Then on the annual Jashin, which is the celebration uh, at uh, New Year's in March, lo and behold, a squadron of MiG-17s flew, uh, flew over the celebration. The ambassador looked at the foreign minister, and the foreign minister shrugged his shoulders. Uh, so Afghanistan went from gypsy moss to MiG-17s overnight. Uh, in May of 1956, uh, based on a uh, request by Eisenhower to the intelligence community to determine what the strategic interest of what strategic interest Afghanistan was the United States, with the sub-question, if if it is subsumed within the Soviet Union, is of any any worry to us? The, this was answered by saying that there's absolutely no strategic reason for us to be worried about Afghanistan. Uh, that came out at the end of May, and fortunately for me, because I was still in Afghanistan at the end of May, I came back in June. Now, when I arrived in Afghanistan, this is very interesting, the big issue was Greater Pakhtunistan. The Afghans had had publicly announced that they no longer recognized the Duran Line, which was the boundary that was drawn by the British between, at that time, British India and uh, Afghanistan. And they were calling for the unification of all Patans. At the same time, the, Af the Pakistanis were very much worried about this. And there was an awful lot of hostility between Pakistan and Afghanistan over this issue. One of the most interesting things to me in this, um, the whole war with the Soviets and uh, particularly ISI, Pakistani ISI's relationship with the Taliban, these are the same guys they were worried about back in 1956 and 57, and now they're in bed with them. Uh, I, that's one of the things I've never been able to understand. Now, when the, um, when the Soviets invaded, most of us that had, were old Middle Eastern hands found it, wondered why. One of the things that concerned me, weren't they worried about what effects this was going to have on their position in Muslim states? Uh, also, uh, they apparently at the time they invaded weren't concerned about our reaction. Which would which would makes me wonder just how good their political coverage, the KGB's political coverage, was of what was going on in the United States and what our policy might be. Now, when the war started, uh, I got uh, when the Soviets invaded. I got inv I got, was involved with uh, the Afghan war for about a year and a half. Uh, in his book. Mr. Cole mentions uh, Abdul Haq, who uh, was a, who was one of the uh, one of the leaders. Uh, we brought him out of Afghanistan, and I and a couple of other people took him to one of our secret locations, and we spent a week debriefing him. And what we wanted to do was find out everything that he had learned up to that date, and what it was we could provide him in the way of help. Uh, it was it was very interesting for me, and also we had a long discussion. Just what's your biggest problem? And of course he said landmines. Uh, even late in the book, it was still landmines, even though they got uh, China had some Chinese uh, equipment for uh, taking you know for rooting up landmines. So we gave him some training and spent a lot of time with him, on, about a whole day with him on landmines. We didn't have much time with him. He was only with us for about eight days. And the other thing, we had, at this time we had not yet begun uh, providing uh, the Mujahideen with overhead. So I asked them, when you're, when you're casing a Soviet installation, uh, what do you use for photography? And he says, oh, well, we, uh, 
we use color photography. And he says, it has one drawback. And I said, what was that? I said, we have to send it to Peshawar to get developed. <laughs> so I said, well, why do you use color photography? Well, because we like to have the colors and everything when we're examining the pictures and, and the target. And I said, look, why don't you get yourself a Hasselblad 88 millimeter camera and get the, get the finest grain film you can. You can, I know from experience, I, you can read a license plate uh, off of a negative of those things at 700 meters. And he's, you know, really, he was very much impressed. And also, you can immediately develop these things in place. So presumably, we got him some help on photography. Uh, also, at that time, I managed to recruit a couple pretty good penetrations. Unfortunately, at that time, as Milt knows full well, the half-life of agents recruited in Afghanistan wasn't very long. One of the guys was a senior officer in uh, uh, internal security in the Ministry of in Interior, and the other one was one of Goldbedin's, Goldbedin Heck Matiar's uh, principal financial supporters and one of, uh, and one of his advisors. The last time I saw him, uh, he had come out and he, he told me he was going to Terme as the Global Dean wanted him there, and uh, that's the last time. We never saw him. I never heard of him. I don't know what happened to him. The other guy, the uh, penetration of the Ministry of Interior, uh, was executed in 1980. And uh, I went on to other things in early 1981. So that was my, uh, my experience with um, uh, Afghanistan. Now, one other thing I'd like to mention. During Iran-Contra, one of the beliefs when the, um, when, uh, the planes were burned at uh, Desert One, one of the beliefs that was in one of the rumors as it was spreading around Tehran is that it was not a rescue mission. The rescue mission was just a cover. What the United States was doing in secret with Iran was using, was using the uh, eastern desert as a staging area to supply arms to the Afghan Mujahideen. And the Soviets had decided to stop it and launched missiles at Desert One, and that's why that was what caused the fiasco. Now, actually there was some truth to this because during Iran-Contra, one of the things that the Iranians brought up with me was, uh, look, why are you doing everything through Pakistan? I, we know for a fact, uh, one of the guys I was dealing with spending a lot of time in, in uh, Afghanistan talking to the Mujahideen, we know for a fact that the Pakistanis aren't playing honest with you. Why don't you do it with us? Uh, I guarantee you, whatever, you, whatever goes through it, It'll get, to, it'll get to where it's going. Um, we declined the invitation, but I was always interested in that. And one of the two, I was dealing with Revolutionary Guards, and one of them uh, told me that they had, they had managed to get 10 of our stingers that we were, uh, that we were diverse, dispersing in Afghanistan. Uh, the two guys I dealt with have done very well, incidentally. One's ambassador, the Iranian ambassador in Peking, and the other one is a deputy in the Majlis. Uh, that's all I have to say. If there's any questions, I'll be, be glad to try and, uh, uh, try and answer them afterwards. Thank you very much. And thank very much for the invitation, Christian. Thank you very much, George. We have a little bit of time for discussion. I know uh, Steve uh, um, might want to respond to some of the um, comments, but why don't we start um, taking a few questions over here. If you could please identify yourself before. Thank you. I'm Dr. Chris Harmon from Marine Corps University. The question's for Steve Cole. Uh, Milt Bearden has written that USAID went to the Afghans and we worked with ISI that we did not work with bin Laden and other Arab volunteers from outside. Based on your work, do you agree with that? Yes, I see no evidence of direct contact between the United States and uh, bin Laden. Uh, certainly not official contact. Bin Laden, I think, surfaces 
to my understanding, in uh, agency reporting out of Islamabad, late 80s, is a name floating around. He's uh, <coughs> some of the station's unilateral agents are reporting that he's kind of a disruptive force on the frontier. Uh, he's uh, he and some of his followers, with their severe view about uh, Islamic cultural traditions such as uh, the decoration of graves, are desecrating burial sites, uh, hassling other Afghan factions, engaging in intramural combat. So they, he surfaces, I think, first in that reporting. There's a really interesting uh, passage if you're uh, familiar with the details of that period that follows this initial surfacing that really covers the period sort of 1990, 1991, where bin Laden surfaces again in agent reporting as a source of funding and collaboration with a, you know, kind of a radical double coup agenda that is developing around Ahmadiyar. One, to collaborate with this uh, former Afghan communist defense minister, Shanawaz Tanai, to overthrow Najibullah and install Hekmadiyar in Kabul. And at the same time, there is an effort underway to uh, displace Benazir Bhutto, who was uh, prime minister in her first term at that time. And there's reporting apparently suggesting that bin Laden was uh, – around the edges of providing money for both of these things, that people were calling him, asking for help. And uh, it's very interesting because there have been some other accounts that have attributed that activity to sort of formal Saudi intelligence. Uh, you know, I think this is this period where his relationship with them is beginning to unravel, but the full nature of it, I, I think, is unclear. Uh, but that, that's uh, what, I, what I understand to be the case. I knew his I knew his uncle well, but I don't I didn't I I never met him. Mike Benefil, uh, persuasive information. I'm interested in the um, kind of sideshow of Kashmir freedom fighters, and ISI, and I'm particularly interested in the uh, Harkat al Ansar. Uh, organization, and I'm wondering if that's in the book and what you can tell me about that. Well, it's uh, there parenthetically in a few places. Uh, what I try to describe is how um, ISI began to take advantage of the Arab volunteer-run training infrastructure in, uh, in Paktia in particular to begin a more organized training program for um, infiltrating militants into Kashmir. And this really goes back to the early 90s before Harkat emerges. I, so I was out there as a correspondent in 1992. I mean, Srinagar sort of blew up on my watch, and I spent a lot of time on the street in Kashmir. And at that time, the militants were divided among the nationalist Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front and the Pakistani sponsored Hizbul Mujahideen and essentially it was a struggle for control of the rebellion. It was a very broadly based and popular rebellion in its early years and ISI kind of used the Muslim Brotherhood networks of Jamaat Islami as schools and, and then their own infrastructure to essentially hijack the, the rebellion using their Afghan model as a way to do it. By the time you get to the – and so then as they start to get more and more organized, they start to take advantage of their infrastructure across the border in Afghanistan. I remember meeting uh, militants in Kashmir. It was very easy as a reporter. You just go in and sort of stand in a tea stall and say, can I meet, you know, one of the bad guys? And they'd take you and show you their guns and stuff. And then they'd tell you their stories. And they were all traveling back and forth from Afghanistan. They all had – Kalashnikovs with Chinese markings on them, uh, you know, they told stories of their training over the border. It wasn't really very buried. Uh, and I think that evolves into the bigger infrastructure. After my time, I'm out of there, you know, sort of early 90s. I'm, I gather by mid-95 it, it becomes pretty systematic. And and uh, I don't really understand how Harkat succeeded Hizbul Mujahideen because it happened after my time. But they were the next big group. And now, of course... You have Jaishi Muhammad and Lashkar e Taiba, and uh, it's sort of variations on a theme, but it's essentially the same agenda. One thing that is really complicated, but I think has shifted over time, is 
what is the relationship between ISI's sort of cells and militants and organizations and the, and the broader pre-existing Muslim Brotherhood kind of social infrastructure? Because that was what made Hezbollah Mujahideen so effective as they marginalized the JKLF, which was that they had doctors and lawyers and schools and everything already in place to work with. Thank you. Over here. <clears throat> There's one thing I've not uh, ever understood about Afghanistan. I think there are a lot of things that are hard to understand, but the theological um, agenda of the Taliban, was that something, an idiosyncrasy tolerated by its supporters, or was that the primary basis for its external support? Well, it was, an, I mean, if, if by their, its supporters you mean ISI, I would say that it was an idiosyncrasy tolerated by its supporters. Um, you know, Ahmed Rashid's written a very good book, very accessible on this subject, the Taliban uh, and their severe interpretations of Islam are connected to a uh, theological tradition that goes back to late colonial British India and seminary at Deoband, India, that produced a sort of a version of austere Islamic theology that is similar to but distinct from the Wahhabism that grew up in Saudi Arabia. And then there were some madrasas constructed along the border, uh, not official madrasas. Again, it, you get into the intramural stuff, but this was sort of the JUI. This was not the Muslim Brotherhood, the, the really formal Jamaat Islami networks. This was an alternative network, and this theology was uh, – uh, taught at a very prominent uh, madrasa along the, the road near Peshawar. And so out of that madrasa comes this um, theology. But it's interesting because it's still relevant now. What is the connection between Taliban sort of Islamic theology and uh, popular rural traditions in southern Afghanistan? Why were the Taliban able to uh, dominate interpretations of Islam in southern Afghanistan? Why are they today able to persuade large numbers of people in uh, Kandahar and Zabal and uh, Urizgan to interpret Islam this way, because it really is at odds with uh, Afghan cultural traditions, I think. <coughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of know what the question is. I'm not sure I know what the answer is. One, the only thing that I can uh, contribute is the observation that, you know, Pashtun social conservatism is hard to separate from Taliban theology. I mean, they're essentially two sides of the same coin, and that's part of the explanation, but it's not really adequate. There's one thing I, I, I think you, you mentioned it in part in your book, but look, let's look at it this way. You know, the Soviets were trying to forcibly make communism the political the, you know, the, the political basis for Afghanistan. And the way the, opposite, the way the opposition to the communist gelled was on Islamic principles. And I think this is how the Taliban, the, yeah, they used, they used um, Islamic principles to attract people to counter the... Uh, the effects of uh, the growth of communism under the Soviets. And I think that had a lot to do with it. Because when I was there in Afghanistan in 1956, uh, although naturally it was, a, it was a, a Muslim state, there was still an awful lot about it um, that was secular. And if you go back to the time of King Imanullah, I mean, women in, in Kabul walked around in Parisian fashions. He, he banned the burqa. Uh, the house I stayed in when I was in Afghanistan, in Kabul, uh, was owned by a woman. And as soon as she walked in the front gate, she tore off her burqa. Uh, and, um, but I, I, I do think that, that the reason why you had this uh, very, very uh, vital Islamic movement is because it was perceived by the by uh, the leaders who opposed uh, the com you know the communization of Afghanistan as being the way to the way to go about confronting it. <laughs>
On the bright side, the only <clears throat> the only good jokes ever in Afghanistan are jokes about mullahs. So <laughs> I don't know how they manage that. Right? Yeah, the the Iranians, uh, the Iranian peasants have a great <clears throat> saying about um, mullahs, and, and it's "Jibshun tan adre," which means basically their their pockets have no bottoms. <laughs> yes, gentlemen, in the red. Thanks. I'm uh, John Judge with 911 Citizens Watch. And uh, I had uh, two themes I wanted to ask you to address. One is whether you did any work in the book or came across uh, General Muammar Ahmad, uh, who uh, was a head of Pakistani ISI, or at least a, a ranking officer there, who visited the United States just before the attack and met with George Tenet and Schultz and others, and then uh, at least reportedly was removed from the ISI and has returned for being too close to bin Laden and also for sending $100,000 uh, through to Muhammad Atta in Florida, and whether the theme of your book is, is that U.S. funding into ISI in relation to Afghanistan uh, had completely stopped by the, the 1980s. I mean, there was, there was a record at least of some funding that went through to try to stop the growing of opium in the more recent period. Uh, or, or whether there, there is some, some segment that, uh, that would have related to uh, Ahmad uh, up, up to the current time. And the other was just because Cave brought it up, uh, George Cave brought it up, uh, in terms of this hostage rescue, I looked at it. It didn't make sense to me. Maybe it made sense to you. But, I mean, these, these were helicopters landing hundreds of miles from Tehran. I, I even looked them up in the in the Janes, and it didn't. It looked like they would have had to refuel to even get to Tehran. Uh, and uh, and uh, some people that we were in contact with told us that they were mothballed choppers that were brought up out of out of the depths of one of the carriers from the Vietnam period, and the and the, de the sand screens taken off of them. So what, there was and there was speculation: was this a an operation that was uh, that was from the beginning uh, meant to fail? Care to comment? <laughs> well, I'm going to on the first question, uh, and then I'll let George reply if he wishes. Um, Mahmoud Ahmed was the director general of ISI from the months after the coup d'état that brought uh, Musharraf to power until, as you point out, the fall of 2001. And yes, the book does, does describe in some detail uh, American dealings with him, which were generally unhappy. The one uh, incident that remains fresh in my mind was that, you know, it's sort of standard part of the liaison world to try to develop a personal relationship with your counterpart. And so the Islamabad uh, station was trying to figure out how to connect to Mahmoud Ahmed, who's a strange character. He was a very sort of a neo-British figure in his presentation, had a, I believe, a kind of a waxed mustache and a very correct spit and polish appearance. And uh, so they did some research and they discovered that he had written uh, a graduate thesis on uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. And so when he first came to the United States on a liaison visit, they uh, got someone from uh, Carlisle to take him on a walking tour uh, of Gettysburg. And they wandered around and he had a very animated, wonderful day. And they came back thinking, okay, we've got, you know, we've got a beginning here. We can start to work with this guy and maybe we'll turn this whole uh, problem about getting after bin Laden and al-Qaeda around. And, and he went back and just kind of shut the whole thing down, and uh, as I understand it, it was uh, the most distant and uh, difficult partner that they'd had, even in a series of quite distant and difficult partners. Yeah, I, I knew Mahmoud myself, and uh, he was exactly as described. Uh, he would have possibly been a general in anybody's army. Uh, he took offense with the fact that we had stayed in Afghanistan or in, in Pakistan uh, between the 79 and 89 and uh, used their territory uh, to drive, do what it took to drive the Soviets out of Afghanistan and, and that probably brought them uh, several thousand casualties in, on their own territory uh, from terrorist attacks. And then the Soviets had hardly gone before the Chargé d'Affaires at the American Embassy went over and delivered a note says, by the way, tag, you're it, you're sanctioned, there'll be no more military-to-military -military contact. Um, the F-16s you think you bought, you won't get. And they said, okay, give us our money back. And we said, well, that doesn't work either. You don't get the money back either. And bam, 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 down the line. And 
he was a student of the U.S. He knew quite a bit about uh, where we came from, and he knew how we went through and, and built ourselves as a nation. And uh, he's, in a very eloquent way, had, had made clear to me at one point that uh, he didn't think we were living up to our potential. Now, you can argue either way. The connections of the hundred thousand dollars in Muhammad Ali. Never heard that. I, I've never heard, heard it. It's out there and it's heard. around. And I, and I think it's just uh, it's out there and Elvis is out there and everything else is out there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank. I suppose they did. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, I I don't think it's ever gotten any legs. But I mean, maybe you can help that. Yeah. It'd be interesting if true. It, time is almost up, uh, but let's take just a, maybe a couple more questions, and we'll give the panelists one more time to respond. So we'll start down here and just go take two or three questions. Uh, Roy Gutman at uh, U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, Steve, I wonder if you could just give your summary uh, view of the relationship between the ISI and uh, bin Laden. Uh, to what extent do you think they were aware of his arrival, facilitated it in any way, in any sense, introduced him to uh, the Taliban, if they did. Um, and as he was playing a bigger role in the war, and they were playing a bigger role in the war following the uh, move to the north uh, by the Taliban, uh, was there any coordination that you are aware of? That's three questions right there. Let's take a couple more, though, and then put, yeah. Much of a gentleman there. I guess this is the journalistic question, which is... Okay. Could you please I'm sorry? Uh, identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Ben Fershein, and it, I have sort of a journalistic question, which is, with the exception of occasional articles you see in the posts that talk about opium poppies or warlords, generally the coverage of Af Afghanistan is pretty positive, and the coverage of Iraq and the U.S. presence is pretty negative, and I'm wondering if you can speculate as to why that is and if that's accurate. Question all the way in the back, and then this one, and right here, and that, that's got to be it then. <clears throat> I'm Bill Samuel with Radio Free Europe. My question is mainly for Mr. Cave and Mr. Bearden. Um, you know, what was the extent of opium poppy cultivation in Afghanistan back in the 50s when you first went there? Was it considered an issue at all? And the second thing is uh, for Mr. Bearden. Uh, how extensive was the role of opium and opium poppy cultivation in funding the Mujahideen movement? And yes, I, I realize, of course, that you were tasked with getting the Soviets out of the country and not counter narcotics. So, you know, I understand that, but I'm just curious. Thank you. And final question. Uh, um, Michael Rhodes, uh, work at the National Archives. Um, I'm intrigued by. John O'Neill, which is not indexed um, in your book. He's the uh, FBI head of counterterrorism, resigned, uh, alleged of frustration that Saudi Arabia was not being given enough attention um, uh, during the, uh, well, d d during the Bush administration. He, he resigned in like 2000, 2001 or something. Anyway, um, what, what, uh, um, what, what, what do you think is in the 20 – 25 some pages that the Bush administration has uh, classified uh, top secret. Thank you. We'll start with Steve. Um, go back to the beginning. Uh, the questions you ask, Roy, are very important ones. I can't claim to have answered them in a definitive way. I think uh, it will be difficult to answer them in a definitive way. I wish anyone in the attempt. Um, good luck. It's important, and there probably is more to learn than we have available now. I think um, there are some things that you can feel pretty confident about. There was clearly um, some direct contact between ISI and bin Laden over the management of the Kashmir-focused training camps and the sectarian training camps. Uh, from, you know, certainly there, there was back in the early late in the early days of uh, al-Qaeda's blossoming, but, you know, sort of 98, 97, 98, 99, 2000, I think there's um, multiple accounts of a kind of an infrastructure management relationship. And I don't mean sort of every day, but somebody comes out, looks at the camp, some money, maybe some subsidies, there's trucking issues, there are um, bus issues, uh, Al-Qaeda is commanding 
some of the Pakistani volunteers were being put into the field against uh, Massoud's forces. It's a lot of infrastructure and coordination. ISI is clearly out in the field. I, I, by one account, I think American intelligence was reporting in the late 90s. I forget the number now. I've got it in the book. It's like eight or ten or twelve ISI stations on the ground in Afghanistan and Taliban governed Afghanistan. So there's a pretty substantial ISI infrastructure backing Taliban drives toward the north, and Al Qaeda is an important part of those drives. So there's, and they're also a locus of training for Kashmir. So there's coordination at that level. It's very interesting to think about how did this all evolve, particularly. You know, I, I do write about bin Laden's arrival in uh, Afghanistan in May of 1996, and uh, you know, Kathy Gannon, extraordinary Associated Press journalist who's covered the country for a long time, uh, probably did the, f the only really credible right then and there reporting about what was actually happening that I'm aware of. And uh, basically, one thing that's clear is that bin Laden didn't go to the Taliban-controlled territory. He went to the territory that was then controlled by his old ISI-sponsored allies from the earlier period. And it's only by 1997 that he drifts south into Kandahar and gets set up, and he grants an interview, I forget the date, but it's late 97, to a, a Palestinian journalist. And he's now, and that's one of the pictures that was in the Post, he's got a library, he's got computers, he's sitting someplace on the outskirts of Kandahar. It's hard to imagine he made that transition without ISI support, but I'm inferring that. Um, very quickly on the Iraq-Afghan coverage, I mean, hard to generalize for me, probably uh, best done in a different setting, but uh, you know, I think both stories are in a very different phase, and, and uh, you know, we certainly don't have a policy about these things. We just send reporters out and, and ask them to cover the stories that they think uh, matter most in, uh, in the moment. Um, do you want to, you guys want to talk about opium and let me add uh, one, one quick comment on, on ISI uh, um, I, I I can't Im, Im, imagine any intelligence service that is as good as that I mean the 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 reputation of ISI is not a sparrow flies nor a leaf falls that ISI didn't either know about it or make it happen uh, they were between okay and not okay as an intelligence service, probably pretty competent because they all came from the Army. Uh, but <clears throat> there has been a very busy effort to make them into something that, that they simply uh, are, are not. Uh, surely they were, they were uh, tasked with the Taliban in trying to make, make something happen for them during this period that Steve is covering in his, in his book. But, uh, no intelligence service in the explored universe is, is is as capable as the myth of of, of ISI. On the the uh, the late later years, um, the poppy thing, uh, it was there the whole time of the Soviet war. I mean, there's nobody during the Soviet occupation was able to deal with it. It was down uh, probably much lower than than uh, uh, its production uh, is now. Uh, the DEA had a very large effort uh, in, in Pakistan trying to get uh, some things going across the border which were being limited by what they could do by uh, Washington because uh, these would get into the covert action areas of going in and actually running military operations to basically destroy labs, not, not poppy fields. Uh, so not much was done there, and also the Pakistanis at that time thought it was an American or a European problem. This was just as the Pakistani population was becoming addicted. And that happened by, I think, the early 90s. All of a sudden they looked up and everybody smoking number three heroin. And so they had a huge problem them, there themselves. But now we're today, we're at 3,600 tons, which means the, the, that the warlords probably don't need this mythological 4.2 billion that was pledged in Tokyo and never delivered. And that's a huge, huge amount of money on a yearly basis, and it's it's almost critical mass. And I think it will affect how things play out there. Uh, so you know, uh, I don't know about uh, uh, George on the the fifties. In, in the fifties, when I was there, uh, the production of opium uh, was limited, uh, mainly because the population was limited back then, uh, and they had no external markets. And Iran was in those days was growing its own opium. And, and as a result, 
there was no there was nothing no pressing need for the Afghans to grow more than they needed for much more than they needed for internal consumption. This changed when the Shah began his crackdown on on opium, and by the time uh, by the time I left Tehran in 1976, it was really becoming a, beginning to be a serious problem because uh, smuggling from Afghanistan into Iran. And that, that of course, gave uh, impetus to uh, the cultivation of more opium in Afghanistan. Thank you. Well, with that, uh, let me um, congratulate um, Steve to a um, phenomenal major achievement. Uh, let me thank our panelists, uh, all three of them, for uh, fascinating and stimulating presentations. Let me thank you for your insights and uh, comments and uh, invite you over to the boardroom uh, for some wine and uh, cheese and uh, perhaps book signing. Thank you. Sure you did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a guy. He died, you know. Yeah, I see. He broke the message. You know what he did in Beirut? His English was so good. He would go in bars and pose as an American. And, and, and fool around with you guys? And, and, and